Good morning, everyone. Welcome to uh, oral session 3.1b, Vision, Language, and Text. Uh, I'm Gon Hee from Seoul National University, and Vincent from uh, University of Virginia. So I'd like to make some announcement about the session. So as you, as you already know, uh, there will be three five-minute presentation. After that, there will be three-minute group questions for all the three papers. If you have any question, please line up at, at the uh, mic, or you can ask questions online. So please use uh, actively Slido website. So we will take a look at online question and ask the question to speakers. Okay, so I would like to begin this session. Please welcome the first speaker. Hi, everyone. Good morning. I'm Xin Wang from UC Santa Barbara, and I'm going to introduce our new data set, VTEX, a large scale, high quality multilingual data set for video and language research. This is a collaborated project between UC Santa Barbara and Bidance Air Lab. So existing data set for video and language research are monolingual and only contain English. And there, however, there are thousands of video languages in this planet, so it is very important to develop a multilingual model that can serve non-English speakers. Therefore, to support this, our data set is multilingual and contains both English and Chinese corpus. And in addition, VTEX is, has a larger variety of video, video content covering 600 activity classes. And furthermore, VTEX is the largest data set so far in terms of video captions. And more importantly, we have conducted strict quality cont control when collecting the data. So unlike other data sets that may suffer from the caption duplication issue, our VTAX dataset has no duplications at all in that each caption is unique in this whole dataset. Okay, to conclude, our VTAX dataset has around 41 unique video clips and 800,000 unique captions in both English and Chinese, which covers 600 human activities. The videos are sourced from the kinetics dataset. Okay, here we show an example of our VTAC data set. For each video clip, we have 10 Chinese and 10 English captions. The first five of both are collected independently, and the last five are direct translation pairs of each other. And we then split VTAX into Chinese and English corpora, and then compare them with a popular benchmark, MSR VTT, so as you can see here, VTAX, VTAX captions are longer and more fine-grained. In addition, VTAX captions are more diverse in terms of unique nouns per caption as well as unique verbs per caption. And enabled by our VTAX dataset, we have introduced two novel tasks. The first one is multilingual video captioning which is to describe the content of a video in various languages with a compact, unified model. Here we establish three baselines for this task. First, we train individual encoder-decoder models for each language, and then we share the video encoder for both languages, English and Chinese. And eventually, we share both the video encoder and language decoder for both languages. Note that here the number of parameters is significantly reduced without hurting the performance, which indicates that the shared encoder-decoder model is more scalable and can likely extend for even more languages, such as Korean. Okay, so video can also be the bridge between languages. 
Therefore, we then introduced the task of video-guided machine translation to translate a source language sentence into target language with the help of video information as additional spatial temporal context. Here we show a case of neural machine translation model where the polysemous words are mistakenly translated into Chinese. And by comparing the VMT and NMT models, we observe that the video information can indeed help align both source and target languages, understand ambiguous words, and therefore improve the quality of machine translation. As you can see in this example, both the pull-up bar and the do pull-ups are accurately translated into Chinese with the help of video information. Thanks for your attention. In addition to those two tasks, we also have other potentials for this data set, and please visit our website for more information. Thanks. And good morning. I'm Yu from the Chinese University of Hong Kong, and I'm presenting our paper, a graph-based framework to bridge movies and a synopsis. And retrieving movie segments with natural language queries sees increasing demand in real-world applications. People may desire to see the corresponding movie segments while they are looking at introductory descriptions that they feel interested in. To meet such demands in this work, we focus on the task of video retrieval using natural language queries. To be specific, videos are movie segments lasting few minutes while descriptions come from synopsis paragraphs. Here, a synopsis is a brief summary of the stories in a movie. Compared to traditional video retrieval tasks, we may face more challenges because synopsis are preserved rich presentation styles and complex temporal structures, while movies are long videos with human-centric stories. So solving these problems, we need new data, new perspective, and a new approach. We construct a new data set called Movie Synopsis Association, containing more than 4,000 pairs of movie segments and synopsis paragraphs. This slide showcase a comparison between our data set and other data sets under the same topic, playing basketball. So it can be observed that our data have more complex internal structures. We summarize these structures as event flow and character interaction. The event flow module captures the temporal structure of movies and synopsis. The story in movies is presented with a flow of events governed by the underlying narrative structures. The sentences in the synopsis often follow a similar order. So therefore, instead of calculating similarity score using dot product of single feature vectors from two modules, we get the similarities by aligning each sentence to a subsequence of movie segment. This can be formulated as a warping problem on a bipartite graph and effectively solved by dynamic programming. The movies and the synopsis are human-centric, so we propose character interaction module to model characters and their interactions. We use graphs to present interactions, hence the similarity between paragraph and video can be computed by graph matching. To generate graphs for text, we use named entity detection and coreference tool to detect character names and their pronouns format. Then, syntax analysis converts each sentence to its dependency tree. Based on the tree structure, we link characters and their actions nodes to generate the graph. For video, we first detect person instance and inference their actions. Then we generate the interaction graph by linking characters to their actions and the characters themselves in the same or nearby shots. 
Finally, graph matching is applied on the two graphs to get similarity score. This is a partial graph matching problem and is implemented by solving quadratic alignment problems. For training, we first pre-train embedding net models to project elements from different domains into joint space. Then we adopt an EM-like procedure to fine-tune the models since we do not have node-to-node -node association in both two modules. We obtain assignment results and similarity scores from both event flow module and character interaction module by solving graph optimization problems respectively. And then we update model parameters using pairwise ranking laws. In visualization, for event flow module, in addition to performance gains, we can split a movie segment by events. And for character interaction module, the association between characters and interactions become more reasonable. Thanks for your attention, and please find us in the poster section. Thank you. Very good morning. Uh, I am Anand Misra from IIT Jodhpur. I'm going to talk about our work on knowledge-enabled uh, VQA model that can read and reason. Uh, this is joint work with uh, uh, Ajit Kumar Singh from TCS Research, Sasang Sekhar and Anivan Chakravarti from Indian Institute of Science, Bangalore. Given this image of a KFC restaurant, uh, traditional visual question answering models ask questions such as, how many cars are there in this image? which is an interesting question, uh, but, uh, but since uh, the uh, image clearly reads uh, the uh, KFC, this may, may not be the most inter interesting question to ask. Uh, most rec more recently, there are work uh, in ICCV 2019 and CBPR 2019, uh, which utilizes scene text uh, in the VQA task, and, uh, but most of these works uh, still ask questions like which restaurant brand is written on the red wall. We go one step further and ask more natural question or a converse in conversational setting, like can I get a chicken this year? Answering this question does not just require the reading text, but also access to uh, extra external knowledge. For example, KFC produces uh, chicken dish. So uh, this type of external knowledge is freely available in form of knowledge graph, uh, which we uh, utilize uh, in this work. So uh, obviously, this is a new work and uh, no new data set, uh, no data set exists. So therefore, uh, we introduce a new data set called uh, Text Knowledge Enabled Visual Question Answering or Text KVQA in short. This data set contains uh, 257K images containing Im uh, scene images, movie posters, book covers, and uh, more than 1 million question answer pairs uh, with this. Uh, we also have associated knowledge bases uh, uh, to s uh, support this question answering. Uh, this on, uh, knowledge base is like uh, one million knowledge, uh, more than one million facts are there in this knowledge base. Uh, so this is the first data set which identifies the need to bridge text recognition, knowledge graph, and visual question answering. Uh, as, as can be seen, uh, these questions are uh, in, in shown in these uh, slides. They are natural uh, questions when we ask in the natural uh, roaming around. C coming to solution, given an image, uh, given a question, and a large scale knowledge base, our task is to arrive at an uh, accurate answer. To this end, we first uh, detect characters and recognize, uh, re detect words and recognize them, and get word proposals, and we get scene proposals uh, to, by recognizing scene. Once we have word proposals and scene proposal, we fuse word proposal, scene proposal, question, and knowledge basis to get a relevant knowledge graph like this. So once we have this knowledge graph, uh, we initialize this knowledge graph uh, with, uh, with word proposals and scene proposals and question. Uh, and the question, question answering becomes like uh, reasoning over this graph. So we use word proposal, scene proposal, and question to initialize this uh, uh, graph. And once this initialization is done, uh, we use proper uh, uh, popular uh, graph neural, uh, neural network based method uh, called gated graph neural network 
uh, to uh, represent this graph and get a representation for this graph. Uh, this graph representation is faded uh, uh, with the question candidate answer to get accurate answer. So we will evaluate our text VQA performance uh, you know, by various methods. So we first choose traditional VQA methods. Obviously, these methods do not utilize text, so they perform very uh, poorly on this data set. Uh, we also tried a popular QA over KV method uh, called memory network, uh, where knowledge facts are uh, represented as uh, memory units. This method further improved the performance. Our proposed method, which is a ZZNN based full model, which not only utilizes the text content, but also uh, seamlessly bridges the visual content in the image, uh, further improves the performance uh, by 2%. Uh, so, to summarize, uh, Text KVQA is the first data set which uh, identifies the need to bridge. Uh, text recognition, knowledge graph, and uh, this is the first data set for knowledge enabled VQA by uh, reading text in the image. We have a novel GGNN formulation uh, which uh, outperforms the baselines for this task. Uh, but of course, uh, there are many uh, opportunity, uh, opportunities of uh, future research in this data set, and uh, this data set is publicly available. Uh, you are welcome to use this data set. Uh, to know more about our work, please visit us at poster number 18. Thank you very much. Thank you. OK, now we have QA session. Please come up, all speakers. Uh, if you have any question, please line up at uh, mic. Uh, before that, I'd like let me ask you a question from online. The first question is to paper number 16, Vartex. Uh, the question is, uh, what are the standards for selecting images when you collect the data? For example, if you can select the images with less occlusion. So, so yeah. is your question why? Uh, are the standards for image selection when you collect the data? So we did direct collect the captions based on videos instead of images because we believe that video information can, is richer because it also has like audio information, the temporal transitions of the actions. So that's why we s select video as our source. Okay. Is, is that answer your question? Yeah, thank you. And Thanks. Do you have any questions? Okay, then I will ask you another question from online to uh, paper number 18, the last paper. Uh, it's a very simple question. How large the knowledge graph is? Yeah, so the knowledge graph contain uh, more than 1 million uh, knowledge facts to be uh, uh, specific like 1.4 mil million knowledge facts. Okay, yeah. so another quick question. Yeah. How do you deal with conflicting facts? Uh, so sorry, can you repeat? Uh, how do you deal with conflicting facts? Uh, conflict, uh, conflicting facts. Uh, okay, so the uh, so we actually utilize uh, uh, not only the knowledge facts but uh, also the visual content. So that helps in uh, um, this conflict and uh, disambiguation. Okay, yeah. thank you. Uh, please ask your question. Uh, for a graph-based um, movie synopsis alignments. A very impressive work, and uh, my question is, what's the difference between your work and the movie graph? Okay, I think uh, movie graphs is also a data set that annotate the element of the movies, like actors, scenes, and uh, actions, and their relationships, but um, they have node-to-node -node as association, so so this limited their uh, data set size. So we have more, much more movies than theirs. And uh, the second difference, uh, I think they do not directly utilize the graph formulation. So we have a graph-based formulation to deal with the video retrieval tasks, but they do not have. So that is my answer. Thank you. All right, I, I will ask a question to the Vatex, Vatex paper. So 
Um, it seems like video was helpful overall to improve uh, the translation from English to Chinese. Were there any particular instances where it was more or less helpful? Uh, yeah, from the blue force score we just showed, video information is particularly useful, uh, generally useful for source to target tr machine translation. And were there any particular examples where it was more useful and, and where? Oh, yeah, yeah. We, in yeah. our paper, we also did some uh, other ablation study, like to mask nouns and verbs from the source sentence. And then we, we can see that the video information is particularly useful in recovering the nouns and verbs because they are in the video. I see. OK. Uh, let's thank for all uh, speakers. Uh, the second group of speakers, please sit down. And the first speaker, please come up to podium. It's OK. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Long from Zhejiang University. Today, let's talk about single graph generation. This work is done in cooperation with Han Wang, Jun, Xiangnan, Shiliang, and the Shif. SyncGraph is a visual grounded knowledge for an image, as shown in the left side. Each red node in the SyncGraph presents an object, and the green nodes are visual relations between corresponding object pairs. The task of SyncGraph generation aims to generate a SyncGraph when given an input image. The mainstream solutions have two steps. The first step is object localization. And the second step is object and relation prediction. In terms of object localization, this bounding box comes from ground truth annotation or detected by an object detector. Then the whole model is trained by the sum or cross entropy laws of nodes and edges. We argue that the training objective of thin graph generation should be graph coherent. By graph coherent, we mean that the quality of the thin graph should be at the graph level. For example, the red node bike and the blue node tree are both misclassified as men. The widely used cross entropy laws penalize two arrows equally, but the arrows of misclassifying the red node should have more survivors than the blue one, as it will influence more nodes and edges. In this paper, we direct use graph level metric to match the graph coherent objective. Meanwhile, the training objective of thin graph generation should be local sensitive. By local sensitive, we mean that the training objective is sensitive to the change of a single node. Since the graph coherent objective is a global pooling quantity, the individual contribution of each node is lost. Thus, we need to desire a disentangled mechanism to identify the individual contribution which help to provide an effective training signal for each local prediction. In this paper, we propose a novel training paradigm, counterfactual credit multi-agent training. Specifically, we formulate each object as an agent, and the action space for each agent is a set of all object categories. For the object coherent objective, we directly define the evaluation metric as a global reward, and use the policy gradient to optimize the non-differentiable objective. For the local sensitive objective, we subtract a counterfactual baseline from the global reward to derive the individual reward for each agent. Here is an overview of our proposed CMAT model. First, we detect the proposals from input images. Secondly, each object agent communication with others to update their features. After agent communication, in training, we sample object labels for all agents and use a relation model to predict the relation label between all object pairs. We compare the generated thin graph with the ground truth to obtain the global reward and use a counterfactual baseline model to derive baseline for each single object. In the agent communication, we use an LSTM to present an object, and all LSTMs are showing parameters. In each time step, each object pairs obtain a message to update its features. 
For the, low, for the counterfactual baseline model, it calculates baseline for all objects. For example, to obtain the baseline of the red node boy, we replace boy with all possible labels and obtain the expectation over all categories. You may question about whether the training cost is huge if you use all object categories for all object label baselines. Fortunately, we have an excellent object detector. For each a object, we found the top three object classes achieve a more than 99 accuracy. Thus, we only calculate top three object categories to, oppro to approximate the expectation of all categories. Here we present the performance compared with the state-of-the-art methods on visual genome. We can, you, we can observe that our method achieve a the state of the art performance under all evaluation metrics. Especially, we improve the performance of single up classification significantly. The single up classification setting is given the ground truth bounding box and the need to predict object and relation categories. The results means our CMAT model can substantially improve the object label prediction. It meets our design. Here, well, the action of each agent is to predict the object label. If you are interested for more details, see you at uh, our poster. Hi, I'm Seth, and today I'll be talking about our work, Robust Change Captioning. Detecting change is an extremely valuable and unique form of intelligence. We rely on such intelligence to do a variety of tasks, including surveillance, damage analysis after a natural disaster, and medical diagnosis. However, not all changes are semantically meaningful. It is important to distinguish between semantic change and irrelevant change, or what we call distractors. Semantic change may involve object motion or appearance variation, whereas a distractor may involve specular reflection or viewpoint shift. Semantic change detection has been a long-standing research problem of itself. However, the task only aims to sense or localize a change, only addressing the question of where. Yet answering where does not deliver detailed semantic content, and it is more desirable to get a concise description of what and how the change is manifested. Although in, recently there was a research addressing this issue, proposing a new data set called Spot the Diff, where the task is to generate captions describing the change. Although an interesting task, some of the assumptions made are quite unrealistic and impractical in that it is always assumed there is a semantically meaningful change, and that images are well aligned because the camera position is fixed. We therefore propose a new task called Robust Change Captioning, where th we combine the task of change localization and captioning while also trying to be robust to distractors. We created a synthetic diagnostic data set called Clever Change. Here's an example of a distractor where the only difference between the before and after image is the camera position. Below is an example of scene change, where in addition to camera position change, a semantically meaningful change is introduced. There are five possible semantic change types, each related to object color, texture, object being added, removed, or placed in a different location. Now I'll walk over some of the intuition behind the design choices we made in de developing a model to tackle this task. First, with regards to processing the images, we extract features using a pre-trained convolutional neural network, but is there a way we can provide more information, perhaps an inductive bias for detecting change? The natural idea is some sort of subtraction operation between the before and after, but not in pixel space. Under significant viewpoint shift, the images are no longer aligned and subtracting pixels results in a very noisy signal, where in this case, the object seems to have moved although no semantic change has actually happened. The alternative would be to do the subtraction operation in the representation space, which leverages the larger receptive field size and the semantic nature of the representations. And it turns out that this helps a lot in terms of captioning performance compared to a pixel subtraction baseline. Second, with regards to localization, we rely on some type of spatial attention. However, there is a problem when we only learn to generate a single attention map. In this example, we see that a single attention map applied to both images will fail to track the gray cylinder that has moved. In light of this, we propose a dual attention module where we learn to generate two different spatial attentions that are separately applied to before and after images. Note that the dual attention is learned in a weakly supervised manner using only the captions, not the localization annotations. Here, we can see how the dual attention module successfully tracks the moving object, and we also see a boost in captioning performance compared to a single attention baseline. Finally, we argue that in order to successfully describe the change, the model should not only learn where to look in each image, 
but also when to look at each image. For example, here, the referring expression of small sign and thing needs to be grounded to the before image, whereas the word disappeared needs to be grounded to the after image. To model such behavior, we propose a dynamic speaker module, which learns to dynamically modulate attention weights that are used to attend over the before, difference, and after features for each time step. Here we can see that our dynamic speaker learns to focus on the before image when referring to the small sign metal object and gradually shifts its attention to after when describing that it has disappeared. We combine all these components to create our final model and we see it that performs strong baselines for both captioning task and localization task. Localization performance is measured by pointing game where we compute how often the highest attention activation falls in the ground truth bounding box for the change. Note that the dual attention alone does not improve much against the single attention baseline, but adding the dynamic speaker gives a huge boost. We argue that the explicit structure of dynamic speaker where a feature needs to be used differently every time step encourages the proper use of the dual attention. We also train and test on real world spotative data set and was able to outperform previous methods without changing the architecture. Here's an example where the previous state-of-the-art model fails to generate the correct caption, while ours is able to localize and describe correctly. For more questions, visit our poster. Thank you. Good morning, everyone. This is Lun Huang from Peking University. So in this paper, we present attention on attention as a general extension to existing attention models for image captioning. The, the attention mechanism has been widely used in many tasks, including image captioning. It takes a query Q, a K, K, and a value V as inputs, and then generates hat V, a weighted average of V, based on the similarity between Q and K. However, the attention mechanism always outputs a weighted average, but doesn't tell us about the relevance between the output and the, the inputs. Here is the question. How much can we trust the attention? When there is nothing useful in V at all? When it gives wrong outputs? In these cases, we can't rely too much on the attention mechanism. Therefore, we need to figure out the relevance between hat V the generated result and the kill the query, we propose AOA attention on attention. As the name shows, it adds another attention to the original attention mechanism. The second attention is very simple. It takes Q and the hat V as inputs into two branches and generates uh, attention gate and the information. Then it applies the gate to the information using element-wise multiplication, which makes the second attention. As you can see, AOA is very simple, but it can do a lot. It helps to determine the relevance between uh, of the generated attention result, and it can model relationships among different attention heads when multi-head attention is used. It drops irrelative information and keeps only the useful. We experiment on the task of image captioning, where the overall framework is encoder-decoder based. So in the encoder, it uh, consists of a pre-trained fast RCN and a refining module, where fast RCN extracts object level features of an image, and the refining module models the relationships between the objects using self-attention and the uh, AOA. The decoder uses an LSTM layer to model the language and the employs attention and the AOA to integrate image features. We compare our method against a set of other related models with different settings. We design three types of uh, encoders, including uh, the base which does the refining, refining the features and the refining without AOA, which is like the transformer encoder, and, uh, and the refining with AOA, uh, which is the proposed method. We also have three types of decoders. A models uh, 
contest vector using a linear transformation. B uses an LSTM, and C applies AOA. From the experimental results, we find that for the encoder, refining the features is helpful, and more helpful when using AOA. For the decoder, AOA is superior to other methods, especially when multi-header attention is used. Our method also outperforms previous uh, methods. Um, here is the cognitive results. And from the cognitive results, I can find that our method is better at counting objects and uh, modeling interactions among objects. And from the visualized uh, attention map, we can see that our method is less likely to be mismatched by a relative attention results than the compared base model. So uh, thank you for your attention. All right, so we're gonna start the Q&A session. And the first question I'm gonna take uh, from the online questions. This is for the paper, Attention and Attention. Uh, so the question is, um, uh, how generic is this uh, proposed attention and attention mechanism? Have you tried uh, uh, to improve the, per does it improve the performance on other sequence to sequence tasks, for example, speech recognition. Um, so can, can you repeat the question? Yeah, so do you think your attention and attention method would improve other sequence, other tasks like yes. speech recognition yes. other than captioning? Um, yes, what we want to do in the future, we want to explore about the proposed method on other tasks on computer vision or on uh, natural language per processing. Okay, um, so a question for the robust uh, change captioning paper now. So the question is, uh, how were the captions collected? If it is automatically generated, then a uh, caption generator could be overfitted to a few templates. So do you have anything to comment about that? Right, so um, our Clever Change data set is a synthetic data set where we use a template um, to generate uh, captions, automatic captions. Um, so there, there is a definitely a chance of overfitting to this specific synthetic data set, uh, but we made sure that the templates are diverse enough to avoid this, and also um, we simply use this data set to uh, diagnose and experiment with multiple model designs, and we after we have validated the model design, we actually test it on a real world data set and we see that it generalizes to the real world data set. Okay. I'm gonna take a question online again. This is for the paper on counterfactuals for a scene graph generation. So the question is uh, how do you ensure that the agents optimize the global goal? and not only maximize their own goal? Uh, <coughs> because we, we use the final evaluation metric as a final uh, reward. So we direct uh, optimize this to achieve a global goal. Okay, thank you. So uh, I have a very quick question to paper number 20. Uh, uh, my question is, uh, in your data set, how many changes per image pair are allowed? So that's a very good question. Uh, we only have one change happening, but I believe that um, in the future work, we expect to have multiple changes happening uh, in a, a pair of images. And also it will be interesting to have um, multiple changes happening in different time sets. For right now, we have only a single time step change where we compare the before and after image but it will be interesting to see uh, how the changes are manifested throughout time. 
All right. Thank you. We're going to start yeah. the next session. Okay. Uh, please come up, uh, next group of speakers. And the first speaker directly come to the uh, podium. Good morning, everyone. I'm Sibei from the University of Hong Kong. Today, I'm going to represent our work in the Reforming Exploration Comprehension Task. The Reforming Exploration Comprehension is to locate the object instance in an image, giving a natural language expression, and the referred object is denoted as referent. Note, the, ob uh, the referring expressions normally not describe the attributes of the referent itself, but also its relationships to other objects in the image. Therefore, beyond object detection, the referring expressions comprehension task fundamentally requires the understanding of the linguistic structures of the expression, and then use it as a guidance to distinguish the referent with other objects. Think about how a human deal with this challenging. In fact, we identify the compound objects step by step. In particular, the linguistic structures in the expression directly provides the visual reasoning steps for finding the referent, which means we can image the reasoning process with access to the expression only. Then, we perform multi-step reasoning for identifying the compound objects from the visual relationships among the objects in the image under the guidance. For the example, the grounding of the referring expression, the obtainer held by the person in the pink hand requires three-step reasoning. First, locating the pink hand in the image under the guidance of the phrase the pink hand. Next, identifying the person who is in the pink hand and finally, locating the operator, which is held by that person. Based on the core idea of language-driven visual training, we propose the dynamic graph attention network. Here is the overview of it. First, the dynamic graph attention builds a graph over the objects in the image, where all the nodes and edges correspond to the objects and the relationships respectively, and then fills the language representation of the expression into the graph to capture the multimodal representation. Second, the proposed uh, differential analysis learns the language guide guidance for reasoning by exploring the linguistic structure of the expression. And the linguistic structure is specified as a, a sequence of the constituent expressions of the whole expression. Next, we perform stepwise dynamic graph reasoning on top of the graph under the guidance of the predicted visual reasoning process. And each time step, the dynamic graph attention highlights the loads and edges of the graph following the guidance of the constituent expressions and identifies the compound objects over the highlighted graph. Finally, we compute the matching scores between the compound objects and the referring expressions, and we end to end train the whole model without any extra annotation using the triplet loss with online head negative many. The experimental results demonstrate that our dynamic graph attention cannot only significantly issue past all existing state of the art algorithms across the three company benchmark datasets but also generate interpretable visual evidence for stepwise locating the objects referred to in the complex language description. Here are the examples to show how our dynamic graph attention works. For this example, during the first two time steps, the model pays more attention to the kick and the pop shoot respectively. At the third step, it focuses on the compound objects a lady by involving the two identified objects before. It passes the uh, expression into a tree structure and locates the referent a lady who is wearing the pop shirt and meanwhile is with a burst cake. Here is another example. At the first time step, it attends the gray shirt. Next, it focuses on the compound objects a man wearing the gray shirt by connecting the man with the gray shirt. 
Then it shifts Fox to the composed objects, the elephant behind the man wearing a gray suit, by relating the elephant to the composed man identified before. In this example, the visual reasoning process forms a chain structure, and the dynamic graph attention gradually identifies the compound objects. If you are interested in our work, please step by our poster. Thank you. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Kun Peng Li, a PhD student from Northeast University in Boston. Uh, I'm happy to present our paper, Viral Semantic Reasoning for Image Text Matching. Uh, image text matching is one of the fundamental topics bridging vision and language domains. It refers to measuring the visual semantic similarity between a sentence and an image. It remains challenging due to the huge visual semantic discrepancy. When people describe what they see in the picture using natural, natural language, it can be observed that the descriptions will not only include the objects, sentence stuff, but also will organize their interactions, relative positions, and other high-level high semantic concepts. However, the image representations in current methods usually leak such semantic concepts as in its corresponding text caption. To solve this issue, we propose to perform reasoning on the image regions to generate representations for an image. This representation would capture key objects as well as semantic concepts within a scene. We further describe detailed structure of our visual semantic reasoning network. Following previous work, we begin with image regions and their features generated by the bottom-up attention model which is actually a faster accident detection model pre-trained on the viral genome data set. We then build up connections between these image regions and do reasoning using residual graph convolutional networks to generate features with semantic relationship information. Then we take use of the gate and the memory, memory mechanism to perform global semantic reasoning on these relationship enhanced features select the discriminative information, and gradually generate the representation for the whole scene. This reasoning process is conducted on the on graph topology and considers both local and global semantic correlations. To further connect the, uh, connect the vision and language domains, we use a GRU-based text encoder to map the text caption to the same dimensional vector space as the image representation. The, sim the symbol in the product is adopted as a similarity function in the joint embedding space. Finally, the whole model is trained with joint optimization of image sentence matching and also sentence generation. Experiments further validates that our methods achieve the new state of art for the image text matching on Microsoft Cocoa and the Flickr 13K datasets. It also performs the current best method scan by 5% to 13% relatively for recall at one. Besides, compared with the complicated attention-based aggregation operation in recent methods, our method only relies on the simple inner product as a similarity function in the joint embedding space Therefore, it is quite efficient at the inference stage. It is around 13 times faster than scan when tested on the Microsoft Coco 1K dataset. We further show some uh, quality results of image text uh, retrieval. And from these quality results, we can uh, find that for the image text retrieval, our method can retrieve the correct results in the top ranked uh, sentences. To further interpret the model predictions, we visualize the correlations between representations of image regions and the final representation of the whole image uh, in an attention form. And from the attention map, uh, it validates that our model can capture key objects 
and the semantic concepts in the scene. We also show an example of image retrieval for the given text query with attention visualizations. Our model can well retrieve the ground truth images in the top three list with reasonable attention map. And for more details, welcome to our poster. Our code is also available on the GitHub. Thanks. Hello and good morning, everyone. My name is Josiah, and I'm a postdoc at Imperial College London. All right. So the task in our paper is the phrase localization task. And so for those who are not familiar with this task, you're given a phrase, for example, the handles on the slide. So the task is to have the system to automatically localize where in the image this phrase occurs. And so how do people usually tackle this task? So the most obvious way is to use fully or strongly supervised methods. And in these methods, systems learn from a lot of different phrases along with their localization. Of course, there's also an alternative setting where you can use weakly supervised. And in this case, systems know that the phrase is somewhere in the image. It just doesn't know where exactly it is in the image. Right, so here are state of the results on different data sets. And as expected, strongly supervised systems perform much better than weakly supervised systems. Um, so the numbers are good and all that, but what else do they tell us? What else can we learn from this data? And do we know how well, the super, how well these systems actually use the supervised data? And do we actually have a very intelligent system that can actually generalize to unseen phrases or even domains or tasks? So, or do we essentially have a machine that learns to memorize phrases along with their localization? It's like asking a child to actually learn how to localize phrases by memorizing phrases and images and their localization. So that's probably not how a human would actually do it. In fact, human would probably try to perform some inference on more basic building blocks using prior knowledge about the world. And so in that case, they will be more generally smart rather than trying to be a one trick pony and trying to just do one thing well. They can do different kind of things. So inspired by that, we can probably have a setting where we don't have the localizations or the phrases or the images. So instead, we can have a model that's more acts like human and not learn from this data, but instead try to build knowledge using ex existing tools as basic building blocks, such as off-the-shelf object detectors or word embeddings or just images in general. Right, so the model we use to tackle this has three stages. In the first stage, we detect instances of object categories using different off-the-shelf object detectors. More details of what we did and different combinations are in the paper. And in the second step, we filter the concepts, the output of detectors, and we try to keep only those that are relevant to the phrases. So for example, we keep the boy and red detector. And perhaps we might not have a shirt detector, but we try to find the most similar object detector, for example, clothing in this case. And we do this by computing the cosine similarity between the embedding of shirt and the word embedding for the detector label clothing. And with that, we filter out the detections to be those that are only relevant. And finally, we try to localize the phrase using this filtered data as well as some other heuristics that we describe in the paper. Right, so here are the results of our best configuration and surprisingly, we did very well considering we have not even used any of this phrase localization data for training. And in fact, we perform even better than weekly supervised data. But these this numbers are not comparable because the systems use different detectors as well as different settings. So just take the numbers with a grain of salt. Right, so considering the strong performance of our baseline, we should actually probably propose to use this non-pad setting as a baseline for this task, and in fact, maybe other vision language tasks. And 
also there might be a bias in the data set or the task itself. So considering that our system actually performs very well with a very simple method. So it is quite important that we should not be trying to make our models more and more complicated without actually trying to understand the data set or the task itself. And finally, we should be able to use the paired data more effectively on top of what we can already do it without paired data. So this will lead to better generalization of for different vision and language tasks. And this is important if you want to progress further in having an AI that's more general and can tackle all different tasks rather than one specific task. And with that, I end my presentation. Thank you, and visit us at our poster 24 if you want to argue more. Thank you. OK, uh, now we are in question answering uh, session. If you have any question, please line up at the mic. Uh, let me ask you one quick question to paper number 23, the second paper in the group. Uh, you said your algorithm is much, much faster than the previous state of the art at the inference time. So could you explain what, what makes it so fast? Okay, uh, great question. Uh, actually, uh, we mentioned about the scan, which is uh, what current state of the art. Uh, since it is uh, the main goal of scan is to uh, align each uh, image, image region and uh, each uh, word in the caption. So it need to do a lot of calculations between uh, align each of them. So, uh, but but for our method, we uh, only do a, a pro uh, pro product as a. a similarity co uh, comparison uh, e equation. So uh, uh, we don't need to do um, one to one ar ar alignment for each image region and the uh, text um, caption. So it makes our method much faster than scan. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Uh, I have another question to the third paper. Uh, as a future work, you mentioned that we have to uh, survey more e effective use of paired data, right? So do you have any idea or do you have any immediate future work you want to do? Well, I haven't really thought about that. Okay. But this, is, this whole paper is more the idea that we shouldn't just be using data blindly and feeding it to neural network and making, a, <laughs> making the models more complicated. So what I was trying to bring across is we should probably look at the data more carefully yeah. and think more carefully. Yeah. And so, I haven't thought of it yet, but hopefully someone can think about it. And okay, do it. thank you. Mm. All right, uh, does anybody have any question in the audience? Otherwise, I'll, I'll ask a question. So my question is for actually two papers, uh, for phrase localization and for referring expression. So these are both great works, and I, my question is, do you think your, what would it require, is it trivial for your method to handle uh, things like negative attributes, like localize the person in the picture not wearing a hat, or in the case of phrase localization, uh, localize the objects that are not wet in this picture, for instance, given the examples that you both gave. Uh, could you repeat? Yeah, so my question is how easy would it be handled to handle neg negative attributes, like the person not wearing a hat? In fact, our method cannot ca uh, hold this situation. It's uh, not uh, attributes. And what do you think it would require? Just uh, more training data or changing the model? Um, maybe we need to change the model because we do not uh, design the largest field module, modules for this model. Okay. Also for Josiah, the same question. Uh, negations. Like if you like if you want to localize a phrase that where is the, the object in the picture that is not wet, for instance, or not shiny. Okay. I guess in my case I would probably use some attribute detectors as well to So you think it's just adding more data, not changing the model? More knowledge I would call it, rather than data. In my case, that's why I would say yeah, have some attribute detectors and learn from more general knowledge. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. Thank you. Thank you. So yeah, let's thank all three speakers. Uh, please come next group of speakers.
Good morning, everyone. I'm Da Qing Liu from the University of Science and Technology of China. Today, I'm going to present our work about learn to assemble neural module tree networks for visual grounding. This is joint work with Han Wangzhang, Feng Wu, and Zheng Junzha. Visual grounding is a task that given an image and a referring expression like a pink umbrella carried by a girl in pink boots. The target is to localize this object in the image by the green boundary box. Most of previous works can be categorized into two groups. The first one usually represents the language as a holistic embedding with soft attention mechanism. And the second one usually decomposes the language into a subject relation and object triplet. However, both of them are easily biased to learn certain vision language pattern, but not visual reasoning. Think about how would we humans do to localize this referring expression. After reading this sentence, we humans are aware of if we want to localize the target umbrella, we should first find the pink box in red bounding box, and then the girl in blue bounding box. Finally, we could localize the umbrella. To achieve this human level reasoning process without hurting the performance as previous works, we propose to exploit the dependency passing tree with great details, which are transparent and explainable to human beings. Now, I will give an overview of our NM tree model. Given an image as input, we extract a set of reading proposals gave the language expression as the input. We first transform it into a dependency passing tree and perform a bidirectional tree LSTM to get the hidden vector of each node. With the embeddings and hidden vectors, we decide which module should be assembled for each node. Therefore, we could build the neural module tree and reasoning along the tree in a bottom-up fashion. The final result is the output score of the root node and our model is robust. Because of the dynamic assembling and end-to-end -end train, training strategy, specifically, we designed three neural modules for the reasoning process. The first one is a single module whose function is to initiate and finalize the bottom process. Therefore, it is assembled at the leaves and the root. The second one is the sum module whose function is to play a transitional role during the reasoning process. Since it only sums up score from children to parent, there are no parameters in this module. The third one is the comp module for fine ground visual reasoning. There are several highlights of our training. First, it makes the discrete decisions at each node with the sum module and comp module. Second, our model is differentiable and trainable -trained with the help of Gumbo Softmax. Third, our model only uses the ground truth grounding labels without extra annotations but shows a strong pattern. According to the word clouds, we can find that some module usually focus on attribute and object words. For example, white and man. And a comp module usually focuses on relation words, for example, wearing and behind. In summary, the experiment results indicate that our proposed AM tree model balances the well known trade off between performance and explainability. It not only achieves more accuracy in performance, comparing with previous set of the art models, but also obtains more explainable results in the human evaluation. Here is a visualization example of um, our model. We can find that our model provides the reasoning process in great detail and explain explainable to human beings. For example, our model successfully detects the bananas, the man holding bananas, and the target man in behind. We can also find that the attention maps become sharper, indicating the confidence of our model becomes stronger. Now our code is available on GitHub. Please see our poster at 25.
formal details. Thank you. Uh, hello, everyone. Today, we are presenting our work, a fast and accurate one-stage approach to visual grounding. This is the joint work between Tensei AI Lab at Bavenu and the University of Rochester. Visual grounding, mm, <coughs> visual grounding is the task of localizing a language query in an image. For example, giving the following image and query bottom right grass. We aim at developing a system that could predict the grounded regions shown in the yellow box. Despite the differences in different subtasks and the detailed module designs, most previous studies followed the same proposed and run two-stage framework. In the first stage, a number of possible candidate regions are generated. Proposals are usually generated purely based on the objective needs and are independent from the input language query. In the second stage, the regions are ranked with the query region similarity score, and the region with the highest similarity is outputted as the prediction. Despite the popularity, the existing two-stage framework has two major limitations. First, the overall performance is capped by the quality of the region candidates. If no of the generated regions contain target, there is no hope in the second stage to outperform the correct prediction. Second, as the feature for each one of the several hundred candidate regions need to be put, two-stage methods are generally slow in speed. In this study, we propose a different one-stage paradigm for visual grounding that fills the visual textual feature at the image level instead of each region, and directly generates the grounded region prediction. The proposed framework is generally applicable on subtasks in grounding, such as referring expression comprehension and the phrase localization. Our proposed one-stage approach has two major advantages. First, our approach considers all the possible regions in a frame and thus improves the grounding accuracy by removing the cap of the region proposal quality. Second, region features are not explicitly put and processed, thus the inference piece is significantly faster. We then introduce the network architecture of our method. The main idea is fusing a task queries embedding into, the, uh, into an one-stage object detector. The framework consists of three modules, the encoders, the fusion module, and uh, the grounding module. The visual, the visual encoder is the same as the Yolo V3 that consists of Dark Knight 53 and the Feature Pyramid network. The visual encoder outputs the visual features as three different spatial resolutions. Different language encoders are experimented to encode the language query into a, ve a vector, after which we duplicate the feature in spatial wise and obtain a feature block of the same size as each visual feature block. Other than the, vis the visual textual features, we further include spatial coordinates to have location related queries, such as person and right. The future model then fills three parts of the features at each feature pyramid height, respectively. Finally, the grounding, the gro grounding model directly predicts the grounded regions in a format of books coordinates with the corresponding prediction confidence. We benchmark our method on both phrase localization and the ref uh, referring expression comprehensive data size. We show here the comparison of the inference speed and grounding accuracy to two state of art, two stage visual grounding methods. The left two figures shows the accuracy on referred game and flicker entities respectively. Our one stage approach significantly outperforms the state of the art and meanwhile being 10 times faster then showing in the right figure, uh, showing the right figure. We then showed qualitative ex examples where two-stage methods fail will our succeed. The blue box is the prediction and the yellow box is the ground truth. We observe three representative categories. First, as shown in the left two columns, two-stage two -stage methods frequently fail on queries that refer to the union of multiple objects, such as two people. Second, uh, as shown in the middle of the the middle two columns, queries that refer to staff regions instead of things fail two-stage methods. Finally, as shown in the last two columns, 
uh, our methods generally perform better on challenging uh, cases such as sample with tiny targets. In con conclusion, we propose a simple, fast, and accurate one-stage approach to visual grounding. We have released our code and models. Uh, for more information, please come to our post session at number 26. Thank you. Hello, everyone. I am Arka from USC, and I will be presenting our work on zero-shot grounding of objects from natural language queries. So typically, in a phrase grounding system, we are given an image query pair, and we need to localize the referred object in the image. For example, in this given image, the queries like person in white shirt, animal on the right, or something like hat, we would like to produce bounding boxes for these objects. So an implicit assumption in phrase grounding is that the queried object is encountered in the training set. For instance, if our training set only includes two phrases like red car and a blue shirt, a typical test case would be a blue car. As an extension, we introduce zero-shot grounding to also include objects not seen during training. So examples like blue chair or red minivan or a moped are also included in the test set. We now look at how our typical grounding system works. Given an image, we extract out candidate proposals and then pose it as a ranking problem. That is, we disambiguate between similar proposals based on the given query. Note that a region proposal network derived from an object detector produces these candidate proposals, and we assume that the target object is among these proposals. But what happens if the queried object is novel? For example, if we query hat, there would be no proposal containing hat since the object detectors would treat it as a background. Therefore, in the zero-shot grounding setting, our target object might not be proposed at all as it was never seen during the training phase. So in our proposed solution, we get rid of the explicit object detection stage and instead develop a one-stage grounding system which we call ZSGNet. Essentially, we score the dense proposals and choose the best proposal for the given query phrase and finally regress it to a tighter bounding box. Note that our model can learn directly from the grounding dataset and we, need, and we don't need any object detection dataset. To gain further insights, we use a four-way characterization of zero-shot grounding. So in case zero, the query word is novel. So something like automobile, chair, minivan, moped are all novel query words not seen during training. Note that even synonyms like automobile are considered zero-shot in this case. In case one, the queried object belongs to a new category like in this case blue chair which is belongs to furniture, different from those in the training set. In uh, case two and three, objects similar to the query are seen in the training set. For example, car is similar to a minivan which is seen in the training. Note that we are using similarity only in the language space. So in case two, no other similar object like uh, no other similar object to minivan like a car is seen in the test image. However, in case three, at least one similar object to the queried object moped like the car is also present in the test image, which requires additional disambiguity. For evaluations, we create data sets for each of these cases by subsampling Flickr 30K and Visual Genome. We first look at some results on standard grounding datasets. We use accuracy at IO equal to 0.5 as our metric. In particular, we observe a large performance boost on RefClef and similar performance on Flickr 30K. The performance gap in RefClef is explained by the fact that many of the queried objects are not present in the object detection classes. On the zero-shot datasets, to have a fair comparison with prior work, we create a new baseline called QRG, which is based on a prior work, but with glove embeddings. So in the zero-shot setting, we find a uniform three to four performance boost uh, when shifting from a two-stage to a one-stage grounding uh, in all cases. Now we visualize some of our results on the zero-shot datasets. In general, we find good performance on synonyms or when there is just one prominent object. 
However, it fails when there are multiple novel objects. The network also gives reasonable results when the new objects are visually similar to the seen objects. However, it often gets confused when both both seen and unseen objects are in the test image, like in the case of a, a case given of the plant and the planter. Thank you for listening. Please visit our poster number 27 for more details. Thank you. So we started Q and A. Uh, is there somebody in the audience asking questions? Otherwise, we okay over there. Yes. Uh, have a question for the first speaker. So, what if the results of your dependency parsing tree is wrong, and how can you conduct the reasoning at that time? Thanks. Um, your question is without uh, the dependency parsing tree. Yes. Uh, now our paper is uh, relies on the dependency parsing tree because uh, it provides the um, tree with transparent and explainable. Um, this is our, our work's highlight because the previous works um, also try to use the trees, but they all failed. Yeah. Uh, oh. Any other question? All right. Thank you. So maybe I will I will ask a question to the paper on zero shot grounding. Um, so. I might have missed this from the presentation of, of your experiments, but does uh, performing well in these zero-shot grounding cases come at a com comes at an expense on doing well on some of the cases that which are not zero-shot, or is it an no? Thing? So we find that on Flickr 30k and Flickr 30k it gives comparable results, okay. and on Refer it actually gives a much higher performance. It's uh, because in refer it, you don't have main, so many of the object classes are like sky, water, which are not objects, and therefore we get higher performance on refer it, even in the even using our zero shot grounding model. Yeah. Thanks. Okay, so I have one question to third paper. Yeah, to you, and in your uh, qualitative results, yes, the query is relatively short. I mean, red car or something. So does your method handle with very long, complex query? So these are just illustrative examples, like just to illustrate the concept. But in general, the queries are much longer. Like I think average on Flickr is like 3.5 to 4 words. On Referred, it's slightly higher, five, 5 words, I think. Yeah. OK, yeah, thank you. And I have another question to second paper. Uh, actually, your experimental results are very impressive. I mean, performance gaps are very large. Could you uh, elaborate what makes your method so powerful? I mean, mm. where that big uh, performance gain from? Yeah, I, I think for the traditional two-stage framework, because the first stage is to generate, extract the candidate regions uh, so if you use if the all the candidate regions doesn't include the target, then the performance will be very bad, I think. But for our work, because we generate uh, all the features for all the regions of the images, so the candidate site will be larger than the original two-stage framework. So this is the reason that we can handle a lot of different situations. So we have a great performance in the end. Thank you. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Thanks. Yeah, let's thank all the speakers. Yeah. Uh, please come up next group of speakers. Hey all, my name is Michalis Raptis and I will present my team's work on end-to-end -end text recognition. We introduce a system that handles the challenges of arbitrary text orientation and curvature. At first sight, text recognition in the wild seems simple. Just uh, detect text with an object detector and then parse it with an OCR system. Even doing this simple and popular approach comes with the, the added complication of predicting rotating bounding boxes, which requires customizing generic object detection systems. 
As you can understand, this becomes even more challenging in the presence of curved text. But the main drawback of this two-stage pipeline is that it does not allow for end-to-end -end training. This results in a text detector that is only supervised by the bounded box ground truth, while missing the opportunity of profiting from text recognition supervision. As we systematically verified when training our multitask network in end-to-end -end manner, text recognition supervision results in systematic improvements of detection precision. End-to-end -end OCR recognition system jointly train the detection and recognition phase with share components. Recent works in end-to-end -end OCR have delivered substantial accuracy improvements, but still they have limitations when it comes to operating in the wild. Fouts cannot handle curved text, while text spotter performs single shot character-based recognition and does not exploit text context for sequence prediction. By contrast, our approach is able to detect and recognize text of arbitrary shape. For this, we use insta-segmentation masks to handle curved text and attention-based sequence-to-sequence decoders to, co uh, to capture context. We also obtain large-scale partially labeled data for free by exploiting an existing multi-state OCR engine and obtain even larger improvements in accuracy. Our proposed end-to-end -end architecture builds on mask RCNN to handle curved text. We use the insta-segmentation mask to attend exclusively to text features during region of interest aligned pooling. Foreground attention removes background distractors from access aligned boxes and feeds clean features into the recognition stage. This eliminates the need for complicated canonization steps such as a fine region of interest pooling or and warping curved text. For text recognition, we exploit context through a single layer sequence to sequence with attention. The whole pipeline is end-to-end -end trainable, allowing us to learn a shared backbone from both detection level and recognition level supervision. Training this multitask system is challenging due to the limited number of images in the wild that come with joint text detection, segmentation, and recognition supervision. We obtain additional supervision by leveraging on the Google Cloud OCR API. From 1 million images, we obtain around 8 million text lines by filtering high confidence detection results. Since the OCR engine can remove positive boxes, we only penalize the recognition loss on these images. Fully human label images are used for the supervision of all losses. We compare the proposed model with previous state-of-the-art method and recent end-to-end -end models in standard text recognition benchmarks. We observe notable improvements in the final recognition output. Our end-to-end -end pipeline can reap large improvements by simply changing the backbone network without resorting to multi-scale evaluations. Narrowing the scope to curve text, we observe an improvement in accuracy by 16% in F-score. Here are some visualizations of our detector. You see the predictive boxes and the corresponding segmentation masks. As you can observe, the segmentation masks accurately capture the layout of curved text. Thanks to this, we can successfully recognize arbitrary oriented and curved text. In the right image, we take a look under the hood and illustrate the attention mechanism that leads to the recognition results. You can notice the interesting behavior of the attention Please come to poster 28 to see more results and discuss some of the challenges. Thank you. Welcome to our talk on the paper, what is wrong with syntax recognition model comparisons, data set and model analysis. I'm the first author, Chang Hun Baek. What is syntax recognition? Syntax recognition is the task of recognizing the character string in an input image patch.
then what is the problem? There have been a lot of researches on STR. When we looked into their evaluation, we found lots of complications. So what exactly are wrong with the previous STR comparisons? We first list up prior methods by year. Firstly, as you can see, the training data set are inconsistent. And next, evaluation data sets are also inconsistent. There are many hyphens, which means not reported in paper. And speed and memory are not always evaluated like this. Our solution to this problem is a unified STR evaluation. We unified training data and evaluation data and have measured time and memory consumption for each method. Now that we have unified evaluations, uh, then we wonder which module in each method are really responsible for the improved accuracies. So uh, for that, instead of regarding methods as real names, we regard them as combination of four modules. We measure as accuracy as well as time and memory. <laughs> Under the module combination viewpoint, we consider all possible co combination of STR modules in prior six methods. Then result in 24 module combinations. And six prior methods is a subset of that. We evaluate the performance of the 24 combinations. And then we plot the performance on the total accuracy versus time plot and accuracy versus memory plot. We first show the six prior methods combinations on the accuracy versus time plot, and then on the accuracy versus memory plot. We then show all possible combinations on the plots. These are final grade of plots. Given these plots, we can analyze module-wise cont contributions to accuracy, time, and memory. For example, from the left plot, CTC is better than attention for time efficiency. And from the right plot, RCNN is better than VGG or ResNet for memory efficiency. We did lots of analysis. So for more details, please visit our poster sessions. And feel free to try our web demo. In web demo, we provide the combination of club AI detection and recognition. Uh, we currently use more advanced model compared to our paper. And we released code and data in our GitHub and based on this code, we won first place of ICTAR 2019 ART and third place of ICTAR 2019 RECT. We also released failure case collections, wrong for 24 module combinations. There are some clusters difficult, such as difficult font and the text image which contains special character and text image with low resolution. Thank you for listening. Okay, this is uh, the last QA session. So please not leave right now and please join us three more minutes. Uh, if you don't have any question from floor, let me ask some question from online. For the first paper, uh, it's a simple question. 
Is this the first time end-to-end -end model beats the two-stage model in OCR? Uh, no, because uh, the fourth model, uh, I think uh, 2018, gave uh, really good results. I think by that time it was state-of-the-art. Okay, so there's another question from online. Is ROI mask a binary mask or a probability mask? Uh, is ROI mask a, a binary or probability mask? It's a probability mask. Oh, okay. Yeah, thank you. And I have another question. Uh, you deal with curved, oh, yeah, text line detection, right? So don't you consider character level like condition? And can you compare it? Uh, we believe that uh, going towards your lines yeah. is better because you having a sequ uh, sequential model gives more context and it usually it performs better than character based. Uh, okay. Okay. Thank you. And I have one question to second speaker. Actually, you implement many different algorithms. Yeah. So sometimes. Uh, your performance may not as good as the performance in the original papers. Ah. Uh, how did you make sure your implementation is good enough? Uh, actually, we verified our, um, uh, we have the verification section in the okay. our supplementary. Okay. Supplementary. So uh, in that section, we close to original papers. Okay. So it's okay. Any questions from the audience? Okay, so we can start here because we have papers. Right. Okay, so we'd like to close uh, this session. Uh, let's thank the speaker again. <laughs> and thank you very much for thank your you. attention. Yeah. Thank you.